calling uh, of the patient Christ. Jesus calls us to a very high calling. If you were with us last week, you know that. You know that Jesus' calling is high. You know, or maybe low. He's calling us to step down, not up. But that's the heavenward call. Stepping toward the cross to self-denial is hard. But Jesus meant it. He's not joking around. He intends for us to practice discipleship. And boy, it is tough, isn't it? It's really easy in theory, but the minute you've got an enemy, you've got to forgive or something. The moment you have to love somebody who is really behaving in unattractive ways and they're, they're mean and they're awful and you don't want them. The minute you have to forgive. It's so hard. But He's not playing. He intends for us to hear His call and to live it. Right? And it's a, it's a stern call. I mean, last week's sermon was a stern sermon. You know, there were levels at which I, I, as preacher, did not like delivering that message because I don't want to hear it. You know, I want a, a Savior, not a teacher. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to have to clean up. You know, and it's, it's harsh. But don't worry. Jesus never does anything like that again. This is a one-time thing. He does that all the time. And in fact, in this week's uh, Scripture that, that you all read, uh, we get to hear this. As they were going along the road, someone came to him and said, I will follow you wherever you go. Well, great. That's what he wants, right? You know, Isn't that what you said? You, know, you said, I will follow you wherever you go. And so you'd think he'd say, great, fall in line. You know, I'm going to run here with my smiley face shirt on and I'm going to keep running along the road like Forrest Gump and all the people get in line behind me and it's going to be great. Good. Come on. It's not what he says. What he says is count the cost. I think Jesus sees this guy and, and you know, he knows everyone's heart and he looks at this guy and he goes, you are very exuberant, but you're like the rocks. You're going to flash up, but you've got no root, no moisture. Or you're like the thorns. It's going to crowd you out. You aren't really ready for this. Let me help you think through what you're saying. He says, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head. You sure you want to follow Me wherever I go? And of course, He's not just saying it to that guy. He's saying it to anybody that says, oh, I'm going to follow Him. I am. He's saying, are you sure? Because that's a good thing, but are you sure you want it? Do you really want following him? Or do you just want him to die for you? You know, and do you really want to walk behind him to do life his way? Because life his way is stinking hard. Don't let anybody kid you or tell you otherwise. Oh, as I have already said, I think, in this very sermon, it's the best way of life that there is. But it's no camping trip. Or maybe it is. Maybe it's always camping. Maybe it's never getting to go home again. Maybe it's never getting to go back to the way of life that you were comfortable in. You were a jerk, but you were a comfortable jerk. Maybe it's never getting to go back to what you were. Maybe it's having to be something new. Maybe it's even being homeless. Don't take this on lightly. That's a hard call, he says there. And he doesn't get easier either. He says to another, he said, follow me. The other guy thought he could call himself. And Jesus goes, no, no. You won't be able to do this without my help. Don't go thinking you can do this. To this guy, he says, follow me. I'm going to help. And the guy says, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Now that sounds very noble. And it doesn't sound like it's something that's going to take very long, right? If you've got to bury your father, what is that going to take? About a week? You know, you've got to get through the process of and maybe, okay, so it's at six months. You've got to grieve, you know. But his dad's clearly dead, and you've got to go through the funeral process, the grieving process. He said, I just want to go through that, and then I'll come follow you. That's not what he's saying. Chances are really good his dad is still alive and in good health. You know, it is the, the duty of the oldest son in a family to take care of his father when he's deceased. And he's saying, I've got obligations, Lord. 
I don't want to. I, I I don't want to do those things, but I can't come yet. And Dad's probably going to live another ten years. I promise. When I'm available, I'll get around to it. I really will. Have you ever been there? Jesus' words sting. They are harsh. Leave the dead to bury their own dead. I mean, and if your dad won't follow me, let him go. You come follow me. You go preach the word. You have a job. You have a calling from God. No word on whether this guy turned around and came with him or not. Don't know. But Jesus is calling him to count the cost, and the cost might even be familial duty. It might be that Jesus will call you into circumstances that will cause you to cut ties with family. That's shocking. That is a shocking call from our Lord. Or this, yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. I mean, that is instant. That is something he could, he's just like, look, you keep walking, I'll catch up. I just want to go home and say goodbye. I just want to go let you know mom and dad know that I'm leaving. Maybe pack a thing or two. But don't worry, you'll sleep and I'll catch up with you. I will do that. I'll be able to find you. No problem. You know, there's another prophet, a prophet named Elijah, who called a protege, Elisha, right? Who said just about those exact same words. First, let me go say goodbye to my family. And then he came and followed. And Elijah said, sure. But, but Jesus? No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Incidentally, you know what Elisha was doing when, uh, when Elijah called him? Plowing with oxen. And that, that setting's all over that. And Jesus is saying, my calling is harsher. It is harder than the one that Elijah gave Elisha. I am not more lenient. I am not easy. If you're going to come to me, it's going to cost you something. It's going to be hard, and you might as well come to terms with it right now. That's what he's saying. This thing about putting their hand to the plow and looking back, what that's about is that when you're, when you're running a plow, what you do is you fix your eyes on a point ahead of you. And you run the plow towards that point. And that way you drive a straight furrow. But if you run the plow and you're looking over your shoulder, the plow is going to go that way or it's going to go this way. And when you finish and you look back, you will have done a terrible job. He's saying in your discipleship, you, you be single-minded and single-hearted, single of purpose. Fix your eyes on something and go towards it. I had a friend who told me about, in his, in his, uh, I think it was his dad's childhood, running a plow. And he'd look over his shoulder, and it was terrible. So his dad told him, no, just fix your eyes on a point. So he started out, and he was doing that. And he, uh, he got you know, about three-quarters of the way through, and he looks back, and he's wavering all over the place. He's, what, what is going on? When he gets to the end of the field, he, he, the thing that he's focused on that he thought was a bush comes into focus. That's a cow. <laughs> it's been moving around. <laughs> he's saying, be unwavering. Be serious about this. I'm not playing. It's the salvation of your souls. That's what Jesus says. This is nothing less than life or death. And don't play like it's not. It is a high, hard call. Three times, and they're all pretty hard. Harsh even. Boy, that's tough. It's almost as if, I mean, one might draw the conclusion that Jesus actually expects something out of us. You know, that salvation's not cheap. And then he's calling us into a lifestyle, and we're actually expected to live it. And one might wander from that point into some pretty bad places. You'll meet people who take only the call of Christ in this passage very seriously. They're called legalists. They aren't very good at putting up with failure. Failure's not an option. Jesus' call is high and harsh and true, and you get it right or you go to hell. 
That's the voice of the legalist. And you might draw that conclusion except, except this high, hard calling comes right after some pretty messy stuff, doesn't it? Those of you who read this week, doesn't it? Some very messy stuff. The apostles blowing it. Anybody recognize that guy? I am the greatest. I said I was the greatest before I was so that I would believe it when I was the greatest. Muhammad Ali, man, he was quite certain of his greatness. They have the heart of Muhammad Ali. And I don't mean his excellence and his pursuit of excellence. I mean his arrogance. A guy named, uh, you may have heard of him, is uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Kind of an obscure figure in American history. Once preached a sermon about the drum major instinct. Do you know who the drum major is? The guy who goes out in front with the big old, whatever that thing, caisson or whatever, but the baton is, and he goes out goose stepping like crazy. I'd do it across the stage, but I went bowling yesterday. Uh, you know, the, the one who is just thrilled to be first. Well, that sermon's worth hearing. You know, it's online. Go listen to it. It's a beautiful sermon. It's dealing with this very thing. An argument arose among them about which one was the greatest. That's a fascinating reality because you know what they have just done? If you think back two weeks ago, you know what they've just done? Failed to cast out a demon. That's what they've just done and it motivates that. Why would it motivate that? Because they don't feel good about themselves. Because they feel like failures. Because they feel like they've blown it. And they need to know that, yeah, I've blown it, but I didn't blow it as bad as Thaddeus. Well, at least better than him. In fact, I'm pretty impressive. There were three of them that could say, hey, dude, you don't know. I was up on the mountain, okay? You know, and I saw him as a light bulb. Okay, so I am, I am way out in front of you. You know, I am so much more greatest than you. You know, who are they following? Who are they following? Are they following the one who does this? They are arguing about how important they are. And before we get all bad on them, look at ourselves. Because do we not want to be the greatest? When you get into a fight with your spouse, isn't it important that you're the greatest in the argument? That you greatest stir them? You win that fight? You come out ahead? Get into an argument with your boss. Get into a fight. You know, or, or fail. Blow it. Boy, you've got to prove your worth, don't you? You've got to show you mean something? Is any of that caught up in the life of God? Any of it? No, and Jesus calls them out of it. Jesus, knowing their reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him at his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Now remember, he's just sent them out into villages. They've just gone out preaching. What was, what was it they were doing? Representing Jesus. So the people receiving them were receiving him. That's what he's saying. And what he's saying here is, you think you're all that? I could have picked this kid. In all the other scripture, the, the other tellings of this, you know, in Matthew's telling or in Mark's telling, the focus is on the humility and the station of the child, but not here. It's this is a nobody. You think he doesn't matter. But I could have picked him, and I could have sent him out in my place. And anyone receiving him would have, it's not that you're great, guys. He said, I am. And then anyone who receives me receives him who sent me. And here's the key for whoever is least among you all is the one who is great. Who is that? Is it one of the twelve? It's him. He's talking about himself. He's saying, I lower my life all the time, I put myself last for your sakes, I love myself last so that you might be saved. The fact that I'm even here means I'm putting myself down, not up. Stop your upward scramble. Listen, this is an important truth. 
You weren't chosen because you were somebody amazing. You were becoming somebody amazing because you were chosen. Okay? Jesus isn't lucky to have you. You are saved because you have Him. Okay? And so it's not about your greatness. It's about His greatness. And His way is down, not up. They totally blew it. They completely missed sight of what, who they were walking with. Luckily, that just happened once. John answered. He answered. Meaning Jesus has just said that when John says this. Okay? John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. He's not one of us. He's not our friend. And he's using our stuff. You know, it belongs, you belong to us, and you're not allowed, and they're not allowed. And so we stopped him. And I've got this confused look on the face of the dude. Clearly, John is confused, although I suspect his expression looked more like this. I bet you John expected Jesus to go, well, good job, John. Thanks. Helping me out like that. You know, because we can't have my name being used out there by other people. No, no. Uh-uh. No, good job. He's like, I know. Because I'm the greatest. <laughs> and Jesus, and, and I chose this Jim Caviezel picture because of the, the pained look on his face. Jesus said, don't stop him. Really? Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. John looks out and sees someone not walking on the same road as them, but using Jesus' name, meaning somehow they're trusting Jesus. Right? <laughs> and he looks and he sees an enemy. He sees somebody who needs to be stopped. Somebody who needs to be fixed. He's judging on him and, and seeing him as enemy and, and wanting to push him away. Wanting to make him fixed. Now let me ask you, does your religion make you more like to see others as friends or as enemies? Does your religion draw lines? Does it build bridges? What's your religion do to you in terms of those not with us? to do because Jesus is calling them out because all they can see is enemies and what walking with Jesus is supposed to do is lead us to become creatures that love period that's what we're supposed to become so that when trouble rises up our response is loving what comes out of us is goodness and kindness but which does you which are you better prepared to do love or hate you see that John was in a better place to hate people than he was to love them amazing who's he walking with and then of course the passage that was read to us today uh, and he sent messages ahead of him who went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparation for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, <laughs> it's so awful you have to laugh. Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Of course, probably what's in their mind is the same sort of Elijah stuff, you know? Probably what's in their head, because remember that Elisha called down fire from heaven to consume, you know, a hundred people, you know, fifty, and then fifty more, and the third time fifty people come to get him, they're like, uh, listen, please don't burn up my guys, all right? Please don't do that. If you're willing, just come down with us, but please don't burn us up, you know, because a hundred other people got burned up. Probably what's in their head. But do you see what they're doing? They rejected us. They mistreated us. Let's get even. Folks, do you realize what that is? That's a war crime. They want to do war crimes. They want to burn up women and children and men and old men and, young and, and all of them alike. Donkeys, chickens. Burn them all up. You want us to do that? 
they actually asked it as a question to the Lord. Do you want us to call down fire from heaven? Because you know. Because you know that's in Jesus' heart. That's what he's like. You know, it, it just makes you want to ask, with whom have they been traveling all this time? They've watched him cast out demon after demon after demon. They've watched him walk on water. Well, no, he hadn't done that. But it, they've watched him calm storms. They've watched him feed thousands of people with no food. He, everything he does is generous and kind and good. You want us to commit a war crime? Sure, we've got the power with you here. Three times. Not once. Not twice. Three times. Luke shows us the disciples' failure. And these folks are not small failures. These are absolutely blowing it to the call of the Christ. The cross isn't involved in any of this. I mean, I don't know Muhammad Ali's heart, but I know his public persona. Can you see Muhammad Ali on a cross for other people? I can't. That, that guy was all about him. He was fun, he was entertaining, and like I say, it's his public persona. Who knows what his heart's like? But that public persona was not a downwardly mobile person. And he, I'm using him to represent the heart of the person who wants to put themselves first. It's the opposition to the cross. It's the absolute opposite. Or John's arrogance. Or the, the flames, folks. The flames. War crimes, for goodness sakes. None of this has anything to do with cross. And it leads you to ask, what's going on here? Because right after that comes this high calling. Those harsh calls. How do we put those together? You know, one message that we could draw, I'm going to go back, one message that we could draw from this is that, yeah, Jesus called us to stuff, but it doesn't really matter. Not even the apostles got it. The ditch that's called is antinomianism. It means no law. Nothing's really expected of us. If even the apostles blow it, then surely I will. And obviously, the apostles always blew it. Folks, if you read the book of Acts, you'll be disabused of that. They seem to get it eventually by the power of the outpoured Holy Spirit. You know, so... No, we're not meant to be failures all the time. And yes, the high calling is true. But legalism and antinomianism, the, the no law and all about law, are both mistakes. Huge mistakes. So what's going on here? Well, we get to see the apostles fail. And I don't mean a little... Oh, I'm sorry. There's something in the way. I've I got to go through this. This is in the heart of all of that. This one verse. When the days drew near for him to be taken up. Wait, what does that mean? What does it mean, taken up? I think that's cross, resurrection, and ascension, all in a simple phrase. The days of his glorification. And how is he glorified? Through crucifixion. The great glory of God is a love that self-gives to the point that it's willing to die. A love without boundary and without limit. A love that is absolutely selfless and absolutely horrifying to the flesh and absolutely beautiful to the Spirit. That's taken up. And when the days came for Him to be taken up, He set His face to go to Jerusalem. When Jeremy read this, it, he was resolutely determined. The Greek literally means he turned his face. And from this point on in the Gospel, Jesus is bringing it about. He is on his way to Jerusalem so that he can die. Now it's a mirandering, crazy trip. You couldn't put it on a map with pens. But that's where Jesus is headed from here on out. Everything in the Gospel from this point on is about Jesus deciding to go to die for the sake of all. And that's what's going on here. Jesus is taking people like you and me on a journey. On a trip. And we start in the horror of our mess. And we head towards something else. Which is why you have the failure and the call right next to each other. 
because they messed up profoundly. And guess what? So will you. Don't kid yourself into thinking that you got baptized and came out perfect. You are a mess. If you weren't, you wouldn't need a Savior, and you do. Okay? You're going to blow it. There are going to be times when you let yourself down. There are going to be times when you let us down. There are going to be times when I let you down. It's going to happen. And how do I know? I look at the apostles. They're better people than I am. And yet, they blew it. And they blew it profoundly in ways that had to do with their calling. We're going to mess up. And yet, Jesus stuck with them. I don't know that they ever blew it as badly as war crimes. And that's pretty bad. That is an absolute failure to love your enemy, which is the high calling of Christ. And they want to burn up villages. That's a profound blowing it. And you would think Jesus would go, you don't get it. Goodbye. Just go back to the boat, okay? You're better off fishing, and I'm better off without you. Go away. You know, you listen to some people talk about their own spiritual lives, and you think Jesus says that kind of garbage. He never does. Now, that doesn't mean he ignores it. He rebukes them. You know, when we blow it and you encounter the word of Jesus, you'll get your heart cut. He tells them, no, that's not what we're doing. And they just go on to another village. You know, Jesus will do that. He will rebuke you, but he won't leave you. You could leave him, I suppose, but he won't leave you, which is where our hope is. He sticks with failures. He continues to walk with them and he continues to give us his high calling. He doesn't look at us and say, you can't do this, forget it. Come with me, walk with me, and you will be my failure. You're never going to be any more than what you are. The high calling comes immediately after the terrible failure because it's what heals the failure. Healing is found not in trying harder, but in continuing in the journey with Jesus. And as Jesus sets His face towards cross, it's Jesus that leads us there. He's the one that empowers us to successful Christian living. He's the one that makes us capable of putting ourselves last. He is the one who makes us capable of forgiving the unforgivable. He's the one who makes us capable of giving up anger and loving enemies. He's the only one who can. We can't do it. You look and you see what the apostles did. They were doing that on their own steam. Jesus didn't help them brag. Jesus didn't help them look at friends and see enemies. Jesus didn't encourage them to burn down villages. That was all them. And folks, haven't you seen all you before? The times when you've acted in... That was you. You clearly did that. Jesus didn't do that. And yet Jesus doesn't walk away from it, but He doesn't ignore it either. He calls to you again and says, come with Me. Let's go to the cross. Come with Me. I forgive you, but I don't ignore it. Let's heal that. Come with me. Come with me. Let's go. Come with me. Because a better you is waiting. A you that gives glory to God and beautifies the earth you walk on is waiting. A you that loves enemies. A you that forgives as second nature. A you that is just generous and kind. Wonderful and wonderful to be and wonderful to be around. That's you with Jesus. And even if that's not you today, that's you someday. That's what He's calling us to. And to get there, it's hard. His high calling is as hard as it sounds. What He leads us to is worth no matter what we go through because He's going to lead us from Muhammad Ali to Jesus Christ. He's going to lead us out of what we are into what He is. And that's worth the journey no matter how hard it is. You look into your heart today and you don't see somebody walking on that path. Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling. And He wants to see you new. The old gone, the new come. That's His great good work in you. So if you look at yourself today and you see, you see Muhammad Ali, 
you see burning buildings with children screaming inside of them, know that Jesus is calling. He's not giving up on you, but He means it. He's calling you to something better that He might heal your heart. And if you need the prayers of your brothers and sisters in order to walk that call, guess what? That's normal. It's hard. But if you want us to pray for you today, we will do it. We will do it. Maybe that you came to this place bearing something that has absolutely nothing to do with what I've talked about, but your heart's heavy and you need the prayers of the saints. If that's you, let us know. We want to pray for you. We really do. This is a praying church. And if you're not following Christ Jesus today, hey, it's hard. (laughs) I'm not going to soft sell you this. But it is wonderful. There is no better way of life than following that man. And if... uh, If you're not following Him yet, come with us. We're walking towards Jerusalem where He's going to die. You're going to die too. Then you'll live again. And you'll live forever. If this morning you're subject to the invitation of Christ Jesus, why don't you come right now while we stand and sing. Out of my heart is sorrow and Jesus I come, Jesus I come, into thy freedom glad. Jesus, I come.